I don't know about that. Yeah, we could lose all this stuff. I'll be dancing with the microphone. about the fact that you've been justified by faith and 
we, we had an, a courtroom scene where you stand before the judge, you know, and the judge says, and how do you plead? You plead guilty because you are guilty. And the gavel's coming down and he's going to send you up the creek and you're not coming back. And all of a sudden, the gentleman in the back, remember, raises his hand up. Your Honor, may I come forward? He comes forward and he says, I'll take the guy's rap for you. And that's justification. That's what Christ did. We talked about that. Well, I want to talk about another. And it's so important for us to, to see the different aspects of salvation. Because we live in a therapeutic Christian peddling that's going on in our society that people have no idea what it's all about. And when that happens, it becomes a role reversal. We start telling God what to do, and we think we're the one that deserves everything. So I better stop or I'm going to get on my high horse. Open up your Bibles, please, to... Let's see where we're going to start. Let's start with 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. I've got so many note things stuck here, I don't know what one goes with what. First Corinthians 6.19. I tabbed everybody, but the first one I'm doing. Okay, let's take a look. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Here comes the key verse 20. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When I was a kid, there was a store, believe it or not, now it's coming off so late, there was different, different stores, department stores, and they always had their bargains. And you know when you had the, the, the main floor and then they had all kinds of things on sale, but then there was always the basement, the bargain basement. Daniel, get ready to come up here, right here. The bargain basement. And you could go in there and look, and I'm telling you, some of that stuff was really deplorable. And it would sit there for a while until someone, come on up here, stand right here, until somebody, nobody would buy it. It was just, after a while, they just took it and they trashed it and they threw it out. Okay? Well. <laughs> Here we have the bargain basement. Uh. <laughs> Hospital in mind. Remember you told me you wanted to be a Christian son. <laughs> a lot of strife and patience. <laughs> Engaged in evil doings. Oh. Hey, hey, you are too, you are too. Faithlessness, <laughs> lack of self-control. What else we got here? Oh, hatred, hostility. Oh man, your price tag is really going down. <laughs> you can hold this one. Alienated. And then on top of it all, he has this sign here. The price as is. Best offer. <laughs> Yeah, there he is in the corner, the bottom in the basement. And he, people are going to come around now. Who in the heck is going to buy this sucker? Excuse me, I love you. At you know, best offer. And we all know the story. What happens? God comes along and he says, What? He says, I lost my price tag. He says, Turned it over. Sold. And what's the payment? The blood of Jesus. Price paid. 
And you know, we laugh and we joke about this, but you know, in this day and age, people don't get on this loss, do they? This is basically what happened. We're talking about redemption. We talked about just a moment about redemption. It is that God paid. Now, you realize if I, I have a hard time with this. If I'm this loving God and I have bought you with the price of my son's blood, guess what? I bought you. You belong to me. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Okay, you can sit down and take all your food from my life. And you know, this whole idea of, of, of being purchased, you know, Jesus had a similar re relationship with the Father. Jesus was a servant to his Father. Let's take a look at um, Philippians 2, chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Bought with a price, and now you belong to someone else. You are a servant, or in scripture terms, sometimes called a slave, or a bond servant. And remember, a bond servant, we learned what that is, a person who is a slave, but after so many years, instead of going free like you can, he says, no, I'm sticking with this one because I love my master. So either way, Paul referred to himself as being a bond servant of Jesus Christ. So did Peter. So let's take a look and see what, what Peter or Paul says about, about uh, Jesus himself. So let's take a look at chapter 2 of Philippians. Let's begin with 5. Let this mind think, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a what? Bond servant or slave, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. A servant is what? Humble. A servant is obedient. And this is what Jesus was. Now turn to John. John. Chapter John. Gospel of John. Chapter 13. Jesus wants to communicate to his disciples before on the night he was betrayed. He wanted to communicate something to them in regards to what he wanted to see them do. And it's almost like we're going to see in this illustrated sermon exactly what Paul was talking about here in Philippians. It's going to be the same illustration as what I had done with with uh, Daniel. So let's take a look at it. Ch chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, he knows he's coming down, yep. that he should depart from the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. And supper being ended, and some versions will say during supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. What did he do? Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was made, was going to God. He rose from the supper and laid aside his, his girded and girded himself. Basically speaking is this, he's sitting there, he's the head of the table, he is the rabbi, they are the students, he is the master, right? And they are there to serve him. So he's taking himself from that position. It's almost like the glorified position he was before he came here. And look what he does. He, he goes and says, he girded himself, what does it mean? He literally, after that, he poured water. He took off his outer garment, didn't he? And he put on a towel, and he 
what did he do? He started to pour the water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Place of glory, and now humbling himself, becoming what? A servant to his disciples. All right? And of course, we know what happens when he comes to Simon Peter. Lord, are you going to wash my feet? You know, I mean, after all, um, you are the rabbi. I'm just a student. You are the Lord. I am the servant. Jesus answered and said, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will later on. Peter said, Well, then you shall never wash my feet. And he said, If I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part of me. And then, of course, Simon Peter responds, Lord, not my feet, my head, my everything. Just wash me. And Jesus said, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For well, he knew who would betray him. Pick it up in verse So when he had washed their feet, all right, he took and taken his garments, he sat down again. So you can see that he's illustrating exactly what Paul was talking about. He was in a position of leadership. He was a position of the head of the table. He laid that aside and he went and humbled himself to the point of being a servant and then turning around and washing their feet. And then once he did that, what? He put himself back into the position that he was. He took his place at the head of the table. Head of the table. And I'm sure this really puzzled them. But he's illustrating something. He's illustrating the servanthood that he wants to see from them. So when he washed them, what did he do? He said, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well. You call me teacher because you're my students. You call me Lord because you're my doulos, you're my servants. And you say, very well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's. One another's. Heavy, heavy lesson. For I have given you example that you should do as I have done to you. The number one quality was servanthood, being humble, submitting to one another, and again and again he's going to say what? Love one another, love one another, love one another. Amen? Amen. Well, it's interesting because as you go through this and you realize what he's saying, if we take a look at um, John 5.30, John 5.30, you're seeing where Jesus himself was a servant of the Father. Jesus himself was a servant of the Father. Pastor Walt, Pastor Walt's favorite verses, John 5.30. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Jesus himself was a servant to the Father. He sought his face. He did only what the Father wanted him to do. Just think about that. That's the pattern that he's trying to show us. Okay? He's going to be that servant. And he's listening. He said, you know, he said, a servant isn't greater than a master. The one who sent isn't greater than the sender. And he said, I am going to serve my Father. And it's, it's fascinating, fascinating, because in John, back in John, after he had shared with them that he washed his feet, he then, what did he do? He told them, I'm going to be leaving you. They're going to take me and they're going to crucify me. And what happened? They freaked out, didn't they? They became very, very um, uneasy. And here he teaches this lesson, and then he tells them that he's going to leave them, and this is just befuddling to him. 
So what does Jesus do in chapter 14 of John? He comforts them. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. Now he's going to tell them why he's going. He's going to be a homemaker. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again. So he's trying to reassure them. He said, I'm, I'm telling you what I want you to do. I want you to be servants to each other. I want you to serve one another. I want you to love one another. I'm leaving. I'm going. The fact I'm going, but I say what else? I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Well, they didn't even hear the coming back part. They did not want to have that flesh and blood, the teacher who'd been with them all those years to leave. But Jesus says, no, I've got to go. And then what does he do to help and reassure them? What does he do? He says what? I'm going to take care of you in the meantime. From my leaving to my returning. I am going to come to you. And he talks about what? Sending the Holy Spirit. Sending the, we say helper. It really is a paraclete. Paraclete is like a legal term where you, you got yourself in trouble, you need a good lawyer. That's a paraclete. And he'll be there and fight for you and give you power. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is meant by this. Jesus says, I've got something, you're going to have the Holy, you're going to have my spirit. I'm going to be with you. I'm not really, I might be gone physically, but I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to give you power. Power to fight, power to stand, power to carry out what I want you to do. Power to do that. Let's take a look at John 16, 13 through 15. 13 through 15. He's talking about the Holy Spirit that he's going to send. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears. The Holy Spirit is going to be a servant, subservient to the Father and Jesus himself. He will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify or honor me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Father to the Son and the Son to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in them. In them. They can't grasp this. But he says, later on, I'll tell you more about it. No, just be comforted with that. Comforted with that. Because that is what I guarantee. Well, you know it's so exciting. If you take a look at that, Luke. Flip over to Luke chapter 24. Jesus had told them that he would have the Holy Spirit. And, and he would be with them with the Holy Spirit. And let's see if they caught the whole idea. Luke 24, beginning at 49. Jesus has risen, and now he's parting words to his disciples. Verse 49, chapter 24. Behold what I send the promise of my Father. The Holy Spirit, okay, upon you, and and tarry, and then he says, and tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Verse 52, And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with what? Great 
joy. Great joy. Their beloved was going, but number one, he's going with a purpose, right? Number two, he's going to return. But in the meantime, he's giving them his Holy Spirit, his own spirit. And that spirit, remember we learned that the spirit of God inside of you, what does he do? He gives you the want to and the power, there's that word, power, to do what God wants you to do. I am in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Good pleasure. So we might be a bargain, bas a basement bargain, and, and realize the, the stuff that we've done, and yet he says, that's mine. He paid the price. But don't forget, when he bought you, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself. I love the Galatians. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The Spirit of Christ lives in me. The Spirit that says, humble yourself. The Spirit that it says, love one another. That's the spirit that lives in me. In the life that I know that the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He bought me. I was ready to be kicked to the curb. Better than that, I was on my way to hell. Just like, a, like something done in the, bargain, in the bargain basement. Nobody wants them. It goes to the trash bin that's going to be burned up. That's where you are. That's where you were. And he comes and he says, I'll take that one. Amen. Now, if that doesn't humble you, then you're missing the whole point. There's no entitlement when it comes to grace. There's no entitlement when it comes to mercy. Not getting what you deserve. And then getting what you don't deserve, having him come and buy you. So now we have been bought with a price. And now we need to serve one another. It's not about them and us, and do I keep this, and do I share that, do I leave this at the Dream Center, or do we, what can we do to help one another? We're a part of the body of Christ. It blows my mind when Jesus doesn't say, I want you to go out, I want you to love the street people, I want you to love the, no, he wants us to do that. But what's the key thing? Love one another in the body. In the body. Corporately, we're becoming more like Christ. Individually, we're becoming more like Christ. Remember, you were, you were born again. You believed into Christ. Now you are in Christ. You are in his kingdom. You have died with him, and now you're risen with him. You're seated with him in the heavenly places. That's that heavenly mentality that Walt was talking about. And you know what? We have this mentality of servant because we are servants one to another. Second Peter. No, first Peter, chapter five. It was quoted earlier. First Peter, chapter five. And it's amazing. Peter especially when he says, Oh, watch the whole thing. He's the one that says, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. I like that. Holy boldness. Okay, chapter 5 of 1 Peter. 1 Peter 5. Let's begin at verse 5. Actually, I like the second half, but we'll read the whole half. Whole thing. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Okay, but here it comes. Look at this. Yes, all of you be what? Submissive to one another. All of you. Those of you in a higher position, you submit and you wash the feet of those below you. And those of you who are below you, you're going to do the same thing to them and to one another. Okay? Key factor in the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. We've gone through that earlier. We're going to be living those things because why? Christ is living in us. 
and we're going to manifest his life through us. Then he goes on, he says, submit one to another and be clothed with humility. Oh, the world pushes what? Pride in your self-image and you see how contrary the King of God is to the world? We've been taken out of that. We're living in it, but we're no longer, we're aliens in this world because we're, kid, we're children of God and we're going to be like Jesus Christ. It says, it says, clothe yourself with humility. Why? Because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. When you hold on to your cares, you're proud. You have to surrender your cares to God. Think about it. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Steadfast in the, in the faith, the truth, the truth, knowing that the same sufferings are being extend, experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And the Holy Spirit is going to perfect. He's going to make you more like Christ. He's going to establish you. He's going to strengthen you. And he will settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So tonight, you've been redeemed. You've been bought back with the precious blood of Christ. Receive it. Remember, the giver always gets the glory. Receive it. Acknowledge who you are. And now you can really be proud in Christ because he bought you. I belong to Jesus Christ and I am proud of it. And I will demonstrate that by being a servant and a lover of people and obedient to my master. Amen. 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 Father, we love you so much, God. We just thank you. Thank you that we justified, that you took our wrath for us. Thank you, Lord, that we were just trash. Nobody, not good for anybody or anything. And yet you came along and said, that one I'll buy. That one's mine. And thank you, Lord, for the precious price of Jesus Christ. And now may the spirit of Christ in all of its humility and servitude and yet a mighty um, power be in all of us, O oh God. And may everybody know that Church on the Street is of Christ because we love one another as well as love the lost. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.